Live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE. Covering Dell Technologies World 2018. Brought to you by Dell EMC and its ecosystem partners. We're back in not so sunny Las Vegas. This is, you're watching theCUBE, the leader in live tech coverage. We're here at day three wall-to-wall -wall coverage of Dell Technologies World, the inaugural Dell Tech World. I'm here with Tom Sweet, who's the CFO of the $80 billion Dell Technologies Empire. Thanks for coming to theCUBE. Happy to be here. So, really thrilled to have you on. I think it's the first time you've, you've been on theCUBE. You guys usually don't let me on, so <laughs> you know, they're letting me out a little bit, I guess. Well, yeah, well, you know? with, like I say, we're happy to have you. So, um, a lot going on, obviously, in your business. I mean, let's start with, you know, we're a couple years into the integration. You guys, obviously, you dug in, got a pretty good handle on this. I think, like I said, 80 billion when it started, you guys were in the low 70s, I believe, so yep. you've seen some growth. Yep. Not a lot of growth in this business, but you guys are growing. So give us the rundown of your business. How should we think about the Dell empire, as I called it? Look, I, I think we're, we're very happy with the progress that we've made since the integration, which was back in September of 16. And so, you know, over the last 20 months, we've been focused on, you know, building velocity within the business, and particularly as you think about our major um, tranches of product, if you will. So, you know, our client businesses is growing quite nicely as we evidenced by last year, 21, uh, 21 consecutive quarters of share gain. Uh, pleased with our, our server velocity, you know, last year we were number one in servers. Uh, storage has been a bit of a working process, as you know, mm -hmm. um, but uh, I think we're beginning to see a little bit better velocity in that business. Cle clearly we have VMware and we have Pivotal. So, you know, what's been really interesting is how these, the, the companies have come together, right? And, and, the, and the offerings have come together, together in a much more integrated fashion, which has been fun to watch and fun to sort of help put this thing together. And the customer buy-in and the customer acceptance of the vision and the story has been, uh, in my, you know, pretty remarkable from my perspective. And the client side of the business was, surprised me anyway. That's like the gift that keeps on giving. Well, you know, what was it? Uh, 10 years ago they said the PC was dead, you know? and. Um, you know, today it's roughly half of our revenue and, and growing, uh, growing nicely. And uh, you know, I think the secret, as always, as you know, is that work gets done on a keyboard. You know, and the tablet and the phone become an and device—a a, a notebook and a tablet, a notebook and a phone. And you know, and we keep innovating form factors and innovating the interfaces with with the with the device. So we're pretty excited about it. About the you know that it's just a really good. Really great business for us. I think what Michael said in his keynote when, when IBM announced the end of the PC era, since then there's been four, I think he said four, four billion yes. PCs <laughs> shipped. Exactly. That's, so, this is astounding. Yeah, no, now clearly the market, you know, the overall market for PCs is flat to slightly down. You know, it's going to be in that range, but, you know, in, a, in, in that type of market, you know, our, our point of view, as you well know, is you have to take share, you have to grow. And the team's done a nice job. Jeff Clark and his product team have done a really nice job around, you know, form factor innovation and the, you know, 87 CES awards this year for our PCs. So really good, really good business. And for from us. a CFO's perspective, it's throwing off cash. It's profitable. I mean, you're comfortable with a, what is it, a five to six percent operating margin business? Yeah, I mean, we typically think about that as about a five percent opping business. Yeah. And but it's it provides a, a huge amount of scale for us. If you think about our supply chain our ability, and so it's a nice, predictable, really strong cash flow business for us, so it's a good business. And, and the, the, the higher end, the server business and the storage business is what now, around 7% op inc, and there's a lot of upside there potentially? Yeah, it, that, it, it's a little that? bit higher than that, but it, it, uh, there is upside there as we continue to, to, to drive the business and drive efficiency in that business, and you know, as you know, we're doing a lot of work right now in our storage area in terms of how over time do we evolve that roadmap around the solution set and working more in an integrated fashion with VMware around you know, the convergence of hardware and software into, into more thoughtful and smarter designs around the storage platform. So, you know, that business is, um, you know, that's going to be a really interesting business for us over the next year or so. Well, another thing, VMware, people look at Dell as a hardware company, but v VMware's not a hardware company. It's software marginal economics, it throws off 50% roughly of your, your operating cash. I mean, it's a, it's a gem. Hey, you know, we're, we're obviously huge fans of VMware <laughs> and it's, um, it's a great company growing very nicely. And you know, an extraordinarily well positioned as you think about the world of multi-cloud. You know, and, and what we're doing and how they're thinking about 
you know, any, any device to any device, any cloud to any cloud. That whole story is resonating. And you know, from a CFO perspective, you got to like software margins, you know? Right. It's, it's a good business. So let's talk about the debt a little bit, because I think there are a lot of misconceptions, uh, you know, out there. Um, you paid down $10 billion in debt. I think it's roughly around $40 billion now, yeah, is that yeah, about that's, right? Yeah, that's a little bit higher than that, because we've added some debt related to our DFS business, but you know, I, I think the way you ought to think about our debt load is that very manageable, we're right on the schedule we thought we were going to be on in terms of debt pay down, you know, and uh, we'll continue to pay down debt. I mean, uh, from a capital allocation focus, you know, 60 to 70% of our capital is focused on debt pay down. Doesn't mean we're not investing in the business properly, because I think we are, and we're continuing to fuel that, those investments. And then, you know, we're going to add some debt because our DFS, our financing, financing business, we, can, we use debt to fund that business, but you know, we think of, that's a little bit different sort of perspective. You know, we think about that debt separately and different than the core debt of the business. And our analyst community and the credit rating agencies think about that debt differently. So, and the DFS business is growing very nicely you know, in terms of originations, and it's a, it's a great uh, tool for our, our sales force to um, help you know, in terms of the, the financing capacity and credit capacity for our customers. So, it's a great, it's a, it's a good business. And, and from a tax, let's talk taxes for a second. I know this gets kind of you know, off the normal cube <laughs> interviews, but, but a lot of people talk about that. Oh, the legislation, tax legislation, that's bad for Dell, you can't write off that debt, but it, essentially from what I've read, it's a net neutral to you guys. Yeah, look, I mean, uh, it, it's generally, you know, generally neutral to maybe slightly negative, uh -huh. as, as we understand the debt uh, regulatory environment today with the U.S. tax reform. So look, yes, I mean, they did put some limits on how much interest and there's transition rules around how much you can deduct. But you know, you got a lower, lower corporate tax rate in the U.S. You also have the immediate expensing of CapEx. And so, you, you, and then you, you know, you got the repatriation toll charge, which will, but when you throw it all together, it's slightly negative, but it's clearly, it's not a big cash dynamic for us. It's not a driver of, geez, we've got to go do something with our capital structure as a result of that. So. You know, that's, that's just a misconception that's out there right now. And then the, you, you, you had told me um, earlier that the pivotal move was not about delevering. It was right. a move that you guys have been planning for a while. I mean, that was in the works when, you know, yeah. before the merger. Yeah. Um, talk about that. Look, I mean, Pivotal's done a, you know, the growth of Pivotal and the acceptance of Pivotal has been remarkable. And so, uh, you know, that conversation around should we IPO, when should we IPO, has been in the works for over a year. And look, the Pivotal had to, you know, had needed to continue to, to grow and mature a little bit in some of its processes and making sure that, you know, when you decide to go public that you're ready to go public. And so over the last year, that's what they've been working on. But in terms of the actual, um, you know, the go public and the proceeds from that, that's all about giving Pivotal their own capital to fund their business growth and dynamic. We could have done it at the Dell level, a Dell technology level, but I thought it was more appropriate at the size of company they are that they have their own their own um, you know, capital. You know, they're, they're doing business with over half of the Fortune 500, so you know, they need some substance. And, and you know, it's a great retention tool in terms of having currency for, for uh, you know, their employee base, for both attracting talent and retaining talent. Yeah, Silicon Valley company with its own, I've visited those offices. Yeah. It's not the normal you know, corporate office <laughs> <laughs> down in Howard yeah. Street, right? No, I mean, yeah. you know, they're doing the huddles in the morning and, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, but that's what's interesting about Dell Technology, the family of businesses, the different cultures, the different capabilities. It's a pretty remarkable set of companies. So the market's booming right now. You know, I hope it continues, you know, knock wood here. Uh, but what are the assumptions you're making in, in, in your business? Uh, maybe the economy, you could touch on that. Yeah, look, I mean, when we look across the top 45 economies right now where we do business, they're all growing. GDP's growing. Uh, so we feel pretty good about um, you know, the overall economic environment. Interest rates are slightly rising, but not a big issue for us from, even with our debt load, you know, we're about roughly 70% fixed, 30% float, floating. So the fact that LIBOR's up a little bit isn't a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, currency is relatively stable. So look, we're positive. I'm, and, and, and companies and institutions are spending on IT, you know. The, the round of innovation that's being driven, the round of investments and the, the, uh, the changes in business models you know, typically one of the first things they go do is they drive, they invest in IT to help with that digital transformation, that IT transformation. So, you know, we're, we're bullish on the economics and, you know, so it's, it's a good platform for us. One of the things I've said, you know, 
for quite some time now is that the merger between Dell and EMC was inevitable. You had these pressures of cloud. You needed a company who was comfortable with a lower margin business and had a profitability model that could thrive in that. It just, it made a lot of sense. Um, but you don't have a public cloud and you're comfortable with that, but you've done a lot of work with what I'll call utility pricing. Yep. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well look, um, you know, one of the, the feedback things that we got from our customers is, hey look, I like the economics of the cloud, right? I like this pay as you consume, pay as you grow, that flexibility to scale up, scale down. And so through our Dow Financial Services and, and using our own balance sheet, we, you know, we, have, we have put together flexible consumption models. So I can offer you a pay as you grow, pay as you consume, or we can do a, a straight out utility where the assets are on my balance sheet and you're paying a monthly, uh, you know, a monthly fee, if you will. So all of that, all we're trying to do there is to normalize the economics for our customers. Say, hey, I want you to take economics out of your decision about whether you want to go to the cloud or not, because we can offer that capacity and capability. And let's really talk why and what's the purpose and you know, what's the workload, what's the problem you're trying to solve. And, and you obviously recognize that as ratable revenue. Oh yeah, uh, uh, yeah, absolutely, course. yes. And so, but it's, I'm guessing it's not, you know, meaningful like a software company shifting from a, 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 a perpetual model to, a, or, or is it, I mean, is it? Well, I think over time you're going to see the rise in these types of models, right? I mean, customers are interested in as a service models, you know, and so there is interest in that and I think you'll see that piece of the business grow over time, but I don't think it's going to be a step function change. And, you know, uh, it, but it, again, it's just another example, I think, of Dell Technologies offering customers what they want, how, and, and in different and innovative ways to do business with us. One of the things that e EMC did was they did a lot of, of M&A. That's kind of how EMC innovated. Yep. Uh, no, no offense to my friends from EMC, <laughs> but fill gaps. Yep. And a lot of times those gaps created you know, huge overlaps. You guys are addressing that you know, carefully, I understand that. How has um, the merger, the debt, affected your ability to, to do M&A? How critical is that to you guys? Because you are very acquisitive, obviously, yeah. as well. Well, look, I mean, um, we are very, you know, we're still very active as we look at you know, the technology trends and you know, what type of capabilities and new technologies are on the horizon. Uh, you know, and so we haven't done a lot of M&A since, uh, since the acquisition of EMC. We've been principally focused on the integration, but if you look at VMware, they've done acquisition. We've done a couple of really small tuck-ins within the family. But the other thing, but we'll continue to look at that, and one of the other uh, tools in our tool chest, as you know, is Dell Technologies Capital. Mm. I think we've got roughly over 81 investments in, in technology startups, and principally on the West Coast, but some overseas. And, very focused on security, AI, machine learning, next generation storage capabilities, and, and, and so we have our, you know, we, we get exposed to that type of technology and we put our R&D teams together with them. So, you know, I, I feel like we're in a, a reasonable position and as, as the business tells me they need something, we'll go evaluate it. I want to ask you a question about your, your peers, you know, the this, this, this CFOs. I mean, you're a, getting to know you a little bit. I think you're a rock star CFO, one of our analysts called Said, said the other day, Tom Sweet is a stud. I said, yeah, it's, just, it's the makeup on the cube. But, um, <laughs> but so what's, I don't know going, about that, what's but going on yeah. in, the, in the, well, you got, a, you got a big job and you got a, I think you got a really good mm -hmm. handle on what's going on here. What's going on in the world of, of CFOs these days? I mean, obviously you got stuff like GDPR that gets in there, but digital transformation is obviously yep. a huge theme among the, the C-suite. Security is a yep. board level issue. What kind of discussions are you having with your peers these days? Look, I mean, most of the conversations tend to be around two or three different areas. One is, how do you think about how does the finance function and our capabilities change over the coming three, five years, right? How do you think about the use of AI, machine learning, in, in, in the processes of the company? And what are you do, what are, what are, quote, is everybody doing to innovate around that? That's a, that's a pretty common conversation we're having. You know, security, cyber is a huge conversation point. You know, in terms of, hey, what are you, sh you know, how is your board looking at it? How are you thinking about it? And since we're CFOs, we're always talking about how much money, you know, what's that investment profile you need to have there in terms of what's the right amount? As you well know, mm -hmm. you can spend a lot of money there and not, are you, are you guaranteed of a perfect uh, defense? Absolutely not. And so that tends to be a, a common area, but, more importantly, there's this whole comment, you know, this whole big data conversation that's also happening around how do you help the business make better decisions? 
How do you add and drive value back to the business? You know, how are you using advanced analytics to drive insight back into the business, you know, the various businesses? And so, you know, pretty much the same sort of conversations we're having with our customers, we're having internally or, or amongst uh, the CFO community. And a lot of risk management, obviously. Yeah, absolutely. You know, goes into absolutely. that equation. I mean, inside of tech or outside of tech, are there, are there companies or CFOs that you sort of follow, ad admire, kind of models that you look at? Or? Look, I, I, there's some great CFOs that I've had the opportunity to have interactions with. You know, Mark Hawkins at Salesforce is a, is a, is a, is a great CFO, also a good friend. Uh, you know, um, Amy up at uh, Microsoft, another, you know, really doing a really nice job up there, and then Bob Swan at Intel. So, we tend to sort of be industry organized just because that's how we interact, but they're all doing nice jobs and, and really, really interesting, innovative things within the context of their company's business model. Have you changed the, 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 the sources of where you guys get information? Obviously your peers is yep. probably number one, but yep. as the digital world comes, comes forward, have you sort of changed the sources or it's still sort of the Wall Street Journal every day? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's guys like you, right? We're yeah. out watching the blogs and, you know, look, I mean, look, the amount of data and information that's flowing these days is pretty, pretty uh, can be overwhelming. So, I tend to be, you know, I'm looking at industry um, uh, publications, I'm looking at some of the online blogs in terms of trying to understand where is, where are our competitors headed, where is the industry headed, what are the themes out there. You know, Michael's got a perspective with his leadership team that, hey, he wants us out in front of customers. So I spend roughly 30% of my time with customers and, and partners and, you know, you, you have to be aware of what's obviously what's going around in the industry, not only to have, you know, to be thoughtful and, and intelligent, but to also help think about where does, where do you position the company three, five years down the road? You know, and, and, and helping Michael in that thought process and helping the leadership team in that thought process. Well, Tom, it's been a real pleasure getting to know you a little bit and, and watching you guys in action. Wish you best of luck. Thanks hey, I so much appreciate for coming it. on theCUBE. It was a lot right, of fun. Keep it right there, buddy, we'll be back with our next guest. Right after this short break, you're watching Dell Technologies World live on theCUBE.